here as well live with streaming and the let's start recording hi tony good morning hi kathy good morning. and How you doing? leslie good morning pam morning How's everybody today? Better than yesterday. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, Shirley. How are you doing? Good morning, Shirley. I'm good. All right. Good to see you. Yeah, you too, Tony. It is Tony, right? Yes, it is. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> Pam, remind me where you're from. Is it Colorado? Yes. Mm hmm. And Shirley, you are from Calgary, correct? That's right. Tony, where are you from? Florida. Oh, where in Florida? Tamarack. Where's that again? Tamarack, Florida. Very good. I don't know that. <clears throat> Located in the state for me. Well, it's in uh, Florida. Uh, it's in Tamarack. Right. What's what? What big city is that near? Big cities, big cities, big cities. It's not too far from the airport. <laughs> Very good. And Kathy, where are you calling from? Can I ask Shirley a question? Sure. Um, when does the Canadian border open up? Uh, I would like it yesterday, but uh, they say they say maybe uh, I don't know. They uh, we can't even go out of province anymore. Uh, a lot of people from Alberta go to BC for holidays. And uh, we're having problems there. They're, they're uh, catching people and, uh, from Alberta into BC. And they, one lady had her lug nuts loosened on her car. Yeah. Another one was refused gas at a gas station. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's, we're going to have a war here, I think. <laughs> so you can't <laughs> go from one province to the other? Nope. nope. Oh, my goodness. Uh, all wow. travel is restricted. Hmm. Uh, it has to be essential. Hmm. So. Wow, that's crazy. This is Kathy. I'm I'm in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So, okay, but I'm, I'm having some technical issues with my. So I'll probably you probably won't hear from me for the rest of the class. That's okay. I hope you can hear the class. I can it. hear the class fine and see you, but it's very if good. That's no problem. It's for you, not me. And Leslie, where are you from? This is Athens. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm going to go ahead and start in a minute. And this is a class about a pilgrimage I took to Iowan and Lindisfarne, in some places in the United Kingdom, Scotland, and England. This trip was I took in 2016, and I'm eager to get back there again. Obviously, we're not traveling anywhere right now, but it looks like we may be traveling more places sooner. And uh, who knows? I am doing a class called When Can We Travel Where? 
that'll be um, next Thursday at four o'clock in the afternoon. So check out the schedule on my classes. Thursday, four o'clock, we'll be talking about um, how you can know when you can go where. I can't tell you, but I can show you the resources to find those answers when they're available. As we know uh, very often, uh, the news brings uh, changes. And Shirley, we just heard in the US yesterday, you may have heard this, uh, depending whether or not you're paying attention to U US news and it's okay if you don't. But uh, the big news is that the Center for Disease Control or CDC said that persons who are vaccinated can travel, uh, sorry, can get together both indoors and outdoors without masks and they no longer need to social distance. Now, that's a big can of worms they just opened because they said that it is still up to localities to make up their mind about what they want to do. So I was out this morning at a coffee shop and uh, even though I doubt they, the coffee shop would have changed anything that fast, it said wear a mask when you go in. So I still have to do that. And until the city of Harrisonburg changes uh, what they wanna do about that, um, I'll be wearing a mask indoors, even though I'm fully vaccinated, even though I feel completely safe. So um, what's happening is a continually changing target. And uh, next week's class, we'll go into some of that, how we know what we can do and when we can go somewhere. Just and remember that the, you know, the vaccine is, doesn't say you're not ever going to get the disease. It it just means if you get it, it'll be a minor, you know, a more. Um, less severe. Minor dose, less severe. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I heard Bill Maher got it and he had the vaccine. That yeah. journalist. And I know, I know Pete, my neighbor got it after getting the vaccine as vaccination. Actually, he could, it was the week after he got his first shot. He came down with it and now he's had to wait several months to get his second dose. I've heard um, that too, that the vaccine is causing it. So well, I don't know. In his case, I don't think it caused it, but um, he still caught it. And um, I think part of the issue we have to face here is there's a difference between being vaccinated and expecting we will never get something and being vaccinated yeah. and considering that the main thing is that it keeps us from getting severe cases. And I have a son that works in a hospital. He's been working with COVID patients for now almost 14 months. <clears throat> he works in a, a critical care unit. And he will tell you the big deal is about people getting very, very sick. Um, and that's the issue that we face in the United States. Let me go ahead and shift and share my screen with you. And we'll talk about journeying to Lindisfarne and Iona this morning. And I've got a map that I'm gonna start with. And hopefully you all see that map of the world. I've got a Google map up. That makes sense to everybody. And uh, North America, obviously, and Europe. I'm going to zoom in on Lindisfarne and Iona for you so you can see where we're journeying to today. And I may come out and refer to these places again. So there's the United Kingdom or UK right there. The northern half of it, of course, is Scotland. And it also includes Wales, which is out here, and Northern Ireland, which is over here. And Iona you can't even see on this map, nor, nor can you see Lindisfarne until I zoom way in. And Iona, we're gonna see it here in a second, is off the end of Mull, which is one of what they call the Inner Hebrides. So along the coast of Scotland and the north, east, Northwest, are they call these the Outer Hebrides, and the islands on the inside, they call the Inner Hebrides. And that's what Mull is, it's sort of a backward sea, the way I look at it. And there's a few islands west of Mull. And as you zoom in, you can see a little thing has popped up there. That right there is Iona. It is just a little island, three miles long. And I'll be telling you a lot more about that, but to give you an idea where it's located, this is where it is. And you get to it crossing the sound of Iona by ferry. 
it's less than a mile and it takes you about five to seven minutes on a ferry to get there. Mull, however, itself being an island means you also have to get to Mull by ferry. And as I show you in today's um, presentation, you come from Oban, which is a city right here on one of the inner inlets or uh, locks, they call them in Scotland. And you take a ferry, it's about five or six miles across to get to Mull and then a bus across Mull. That's in Scotland. It's about a three hour drive or train ride from Glasgow. It's not that far in distance, but because you're going up over the mountains and through small towns, it takes you longer. Linda's farm by contrast, is off the coast of Scotland near the city of Berwick-upon-Tweed. And to give you a little perspective, this is Edinburgh right here, which is the capital of Scotland. And about 30 miles west is Glasgow, maybe not even 30 miles. The Tweed, which is a river which flows this direction, has been traditional, was traditionally thought of as the border between Scotland and England for centuries. And the region around it on both sides was known as the borders because that was fought over and switched sides frequently. But right at the mouth of the Tweed is the town of Berwick. And just south of Berwick, about 10 miles, is the island of Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne is unique in that twice a day it is an island and twice a day it is attached to the mainlands. This is a huge um, sand, wide sands. And uh, during high tide, the water runs in and makes Lindisfarne an island. And at low tide, the water runs out. And from here to here, you can drive. There is actually a road, an access road, that, that uh, asphalt access road that takes you over to Lindisfarne. One of, so Iona is completely an island all the time. And Lindisfarne, is an island twice a day when the high tide comes in. They both have the name of Holy Island and they're, they're very related and you'll find out how they're related. And I'll tell you a bit about my pilgrimage on going to both places in 2016, how I got there and why. So there you should see something, a pilgrimage to Iona and Linda's farm, Britain's Holy Isles, both called the Holy Isles. This actually, the picture here is Linda's farm. That's from the village uh, port where there are fishing boats. And you can see, I love, love these kind of boats that have the big fins on the bottom so that the boat can stand on the bottom at low tide. There's a castle in Linda's farm. I'll explain a bit of that later. I'm Russ Eanes, your guide. I'm from Harrisonburg, Virginia. I'm a writer, a walker, and a cyclist. I formerly was a book publisher, and as a book publisher, I love to help authors shape their ideas into a book. Now I'm a full-time guide with Get Set Up, and I'm a full-time guide because I love all the energy that I get working with all the learners like you. Get Set Up helps you learn useful skills from people like you so you can do wonderful things. We learn from each other, so ideally, we can see you and your cameras are on. You can request a recording of this class after class. You email help at getsetup.io. And if anyone is joining by live stream, the best way to participate is to join us and register for a class when we are live streaming today. And lastly, Get Set Up's not paid to promote any specific products. I should point out also today, if you have questions, you can uh, just go ahead and interject your question. There's so few people here. I mean, once we have fewer than 10 people, it's easy just to ask a question. I have no problem if you wanna just unmute yourself and ask a question. I'll start with a quote. There are places in this land where heaven and earth have touched, changed, lot, changed lives and transformed landscapes. That's a quote from a book, Sacred Britain by Martin Palmer and Nigel Palmer. And I love this scene, this is by the way, in the coast of, of uh, Lindisfarne. A pilgrimage, this is 
a particular kind of journey is a journey to a sacred place or shrine. That's just a, de a definition out of the dictionary, or it's also known as any long journey or search, especially one of exalted purpose or moral significance. People, humans have been going on pilgrimages for thousands of years. There's places all over this earth that humans have considered sacred over history and time. And uh, in the Middle Ages, and I'm talking about from about four or 500 to about 14 or 1500, so a period of a thousand years, in Europe, Christian pilgrimage was something practiced to some degree by nearly everyone. The majority of pilgrimages were short distances. They were going to nearby shrines or churches or cathedrals, places that were considered sacred or holy. And they were usually within a day or two's walk of one's home. But there were special places that were farther away that people considered extra sacred or extra holy. And they have maybe have had an ambition to get there. They heard about it. In England, the most famous pilgrimage was to Canterbury. But that was only from the early um, 1200s on to see the shrine of St. Thomas of Becket. Any of us that read the Canterbury Tales in high school will know what that's about. But there were many other places and Iona and Lindisfarne were considered special places of pilgrimage, but also just special places period in the Middle Ages as I'll share with you. I showed you already the map. This is, uh, we looked at, at Scotland and saw where uh, Iona was off here and where Lindisfarne was down here. Both of these communities flourished for about two to 300 years until the invasion of the Danes or Vikings around 800 AD. And I'm showing this map because this gives you an idea again of the position of Lindisfarne and Iona to each other. Lindisfarne being on the border between England and Scotland on the channel side and Iona being thoroughly in Scotland on one of the Western Isles. And these are the years that the Vikings invaded and took over each place. And I'll share a little bit more about that. They landed at Lindisfarne in 793 and Iona in 802, just three years later. Um, each of these places being monasteries were places where there was some wealth accumulated. They often had relics or other things which were uh, re reliquaries, which were um, sometimes covered in gold. And they sometimes had offerings that were brought by pilgrims. So they may have accumulated money or they might've had a gold chalice. And, what, and they also had beautiful illuminated manus, manuscripts. And once the Vikings discovered those things, they started raiding them one after another. And they even went as far inland as they could with their boats to make, raiding, to make raids. Both of these communities are famous for learning. In the middle ages, from again, from the period from about 400 to 1400, that's the time, 400 is when the Romans started to withdraw from many of their places and the far flung place areas of the empire, such as, as uh, England, the Romans had gone all the way to England. And in that power vacuum, there were uh, then settlements by Angles and Saxons and eventually the Danes and after that, the Normans. During that time of great upheaval, Monasteries, in particular, the Irish monasteries or Celtic monasteries were known as the places where a lot of learning was preserved. The learning was preserved because the monks copied manuscripts. There are two very famous ones. The one on the left is known as the Lindisfarne Gospels and the one on the right is the Book of Kells. The Lindisfarne Gospels on the left this, th these are very beautiful illuminated manuscripts was created on the island of Lindisfarne. And the one on the right, um, the Book of Kells was created on Iona. The reason it's called the Book of Kells was because after successive Viking raids to Iona, the monks left Iona and went back to Ireland as I'll, you'll find out about how they got there first. They went back to Ireland and they took the book with them to a monastery called Kells. The Book of Kells is now in Trinity Library at, uh, at Trinity College in Dublin, and I've seen it. It's a beautiful manuscript. Lindisfarne Gospels is in the British Library. I've been to the British Library, but unfortunately for me that time, the, the Book of the Lindisfarne Gospels was not on viewing. 
They're beautiful because of the illustrations and the way they were colored. The monks found various ingenious ways to develop dyes for their inks and many of them have lasted. They have all sorts of interesting decorations, everything from people like this is the, the um, evangelist Matthew and Celtic patterns and intricate weavings and creatures, uh, all sorts of interesting creatures that they imagined existed and drew into them. They're just some of those beautiful work of arts ever imagined. And the Lindisfarne Gospels, as I said, was, was uh, produced on Lindisfarne and they also left Lindisfarne and went to Durham. Starting out in Iona, it has been settled for about 4,000 years. So it's been, people have been there a long time, but its fame began with St. Columba in 563 AD. Columba was an Irish monk, and without giving you the whole long story, he got into a conflict over a manuscript of all things. There ensued a intertribal um, war, and a lot of men were killed, and Iona and uh, Columba, feeling struck in his conscience that he'd allowed this to happen, decided that he would leave Ireland and go far away until he couldn't see Ireland anymore. And he went as far as the Isle of Iona. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out of here and go back to the map again and point something out that's very important that a lot of people don't realize. And that is that for thousands of years, Northern Ireland was closer in proximity and in culture to the islands of, and cultures of Western Scotland than they were to Southern Ireland or Southwest, okay? In the Middle Ages, up actually up until recently, the fastest way to get from one place to another was not over land, but it was by boat over the seas. That's why the Vikings were so dangerous. They had boats that could move so fast and get to so many places. But even without the Vikings, you can see Northern Ireland to this island in Scotland is not very far, okay, any of these places. And so because they could travel quickly by sea and they traveled by, uh, traded by sea, this was actually a unified culture with language, foods, everything. And um, that's why we think of it as the Gaelic culture. Uh, Ireland is the one place that the Romans never got to, and it always stayed um, has kept its Gaelic culture. And there are still people that speak Irish Gaelic. It's related to Scottish Gaelic, which is primarily now in the Western Highlands. Both languages are threatened with extinction, but these were once unified cultures. So when um, Columba left Ireland, he went up here to Iona. That was the farthest place he could go. And he said he could no longer see Ireland because if there's any of these islands around here, he could still see Ireland. So he wanted to go as far away as he could. Um, it probably wasn't an isolated place, and that dawned on me when I was there. It wasn't that he was going to somewhere isolated, but you can see that this was a, a place where there would have been a lot of boats and sea traffic going by. So it was actually a center rather than an isolated place. Here's a map of the island of Iona, and the ferry goes about that mile across the sound of Iona and lands at this little village. Now, I'll show you pictures of this later, but most of the island is actually quite rugged. There's a few sections of it here that are farmed and they're working farms still. You can see farm animals, they call them crofts. And then there's a real peculiar thing on the Western part of the island is a golf course. Now, if you're imagining an American golf course where you would have a neatly trimmed and manicured greens and um, irrigation, lush green fairways. It's nothing like that. In Scotland, golf is a different sport. It's a kind of a wild outdoor sport and anybody can do it. We think of golf in the United States as tending to be a sport of the wealthy, but in Scotland, anybody can do it. And the golf courses are very accessible. Yeah, there's, there's, there are higher end golf courses, but there are Many of them are just accessible to the public. And that's what this one is. It's just a very small three-hole course. And it, of course, is trimmed not by a lawnmower, but by sheep. In the Middle Ages, this is probably similar to what Iona would have looked like. So this is a picture or a, in a, a drawing of what um, Glendalough in Ireland looked like. And that was one of the biggest Irish monasteries. It had one of these... Uh, traditional Irish towers. 
And a lot of these buildings are still standing, but it would have had an outer wall. Then there would have been these huts where the families of the monks lived. What you'd say, families of the monks. Yes, the monks in Ireland were married. Even the priests were married up until the very late Middle Ages. Uh, they were not celibate. And so these were large communities. The Irish never created towns and cities. The Irish had more communal settlements like this and monasteries were considered communal settlements like all of the rest. The cities in Ireland were actually founded by the Vikings. And that's why all of the cities except for Kilkenny are on the seacoast. Iona would have looked something like this with a settlement with small huts for monks and families and other people who were farming or supporting the community living outside of it in the Middle Ages, early Middle Ages. We're talking in the years maybe 600 to 800. The, the, monitor, monast the, the new monastery that you see is later, and I'll explain more about that. But this gives you an idea of what an early Irish monastic community would have looked like. And even though this is Glendalough and not Iona or Lindisfarne, they would have had a lot of similarities to this. I got to Iona by traveling overland from Edinburgh on the train. And then I came to this town of Oban, which is a seaport. And Oban has lots of ferries because you can go many places by ferry from Oban and to a lot of the islands, not just to the island of Mull. It's a very charming seacoast town. When you arrive in Mull, you take a bus, you travel across the bus, uh, the island about an hour to get to Iona. And if you can look at this closely, you'll realize that that bus is the width of the road. And when two buses meet, how on earth do they pass each other? Well, the British roads, the rural roads are very narrow and every hundred yards or less, they have what's called a pullout. And you just see the car ahead of you and you pull over to the side and let them pass. It's very common. I've been on a lot of British roads. It's a bit of a knack to learn how to drive them. Uh, it isn't even a matter of driving on the left or the right. It's There is no left and right when the road is not much wider than the car. But of course, you pull over to the left. How you, that's how you do it. And I was just amazed at the bus rides. The roads seemed impossible for these buses to travel on, but they do. I stayed in the town of Funafort, which was on the Mull side of the I, the uh, Sound of Mull. So I didn't, uh, Sound of Iona, I actually didn't stay on Iona. I was there two nights and I arrived in the evening in the Caledon Caledonian MacBrain is the ferry that goes from Funafort over to Iona. And so I was gonna take that the next day. You can see here some of the rugged hills behind the village of Iona. I went over on a Saturday morning and there are lots of ships still in the harbor. There's still fishing that takes place on Iona. The center of the, uh, the modern Iona community is a Benedictine, a Benedictine monastery that was formed in the 12th century. And that's this building right here. You can see behind it, this hill, this is called Dun E, and that is the highest point on Iona. And I climbed Dun E. Dun is the Irish, is a Scottish Gaelic word for like hill or small mountain or something like that height. You'll see in, in uh, Scotland, there's a lot of places that, that have Dun in them, in their name. As you approach it, you can see again the monastery and there's Dun E behind it. And you can see that the stones that they built the monastery out, again, this is the medieval monastery, are uh, look just like the stones in the hillside. So they probably carved them out of a quarry somewhere along here in the 12th century. Over on the left here, there's a little hill, and that is where they think that back in the Middle Ages, Columba would have had his um, hut or the place where he lived, and, this, and the community would have been somewhere around here. The sun, the um, Everything of that medieval, early medieval community is gone. There was also on the island a nunnery, a place where women monastics lived, and there uh, buildings have fallen down completely. There's a few ruins left and they now are beautiful gardens. I always love walking through the ruins of the monasteries in England. They keep them beautiful with grass neatly cropped and lots of flowers. And they have that in Iona. It gives the whole town and uh, that, that part of the island just a very peaceful and uh, almost sacred feeling. It's also because these um, hills, the high rises behind it are on the west side of the town. And because the winds predominantly are coming from the west across the Atlantic Ocean, it's kind of a quiet little 
uh, oasis in here. So that's where there's a lot of trees growing. It's very beautiful. And this is the village uh, that you approach on the ferry. And you can see there's a number of places to stay. And I'll share a little bit more about that at the end, about where I lodged and where I stayed. And again, this is Dun Yi. Actually, Dun Yi is up here uh, behind the, the monastery. I hiked up the Dun Yi. There's a footpath. It took me about 45 minutes because even though um, it's not all that high, you have to quite have to go a long ways to get up to the top. And from the top, I got a spectacular view. These are looking up to the north islands, the northern. So you can see lots of islands everywhere. And that's when I realized how much Iona had been at the center of sort of transport, the transportation network in the Middle Ages. It wasn't an isolated spot that Columba had picked a place where he couldn't see Ireland, but it was also an important communication spot. Because the Irish preserved so much of the learning from the ancient times of ancient cultures, um, they became centers of learning. They also became centers of mission, and they created monasteries all over Scotland and England, but also, and, and all over the continent, going as far as way as as far as way, as far as far away as Italy and Switzerland, uh, they were renowned for their learning and for their uh, their wonderful communities. The way they shared with the local cultures. Looking down on Dunee, there is the old monastery from the Middle Ages, the Benedictine. And that Benedictine monastery had actually fallen completely into disrepair after the 16th century, when King Henry VIII made himself head of the Church of England, the monasteries were all, which were still Roman Catholic, were all dissolved and their lands were sold or given to uh, people that Henry VIII wanted to curry favor with or who wanted to curry favor with him. And it was like that with this monastery. Uh, I believe it was the McLean family that owned it, a Scottish family. And in 1938, a minister from the Church of Scotland named McLeod came and refounded the Iona community as a place of learning, a place for people to get out of the city of Glasgow and to get out into nature. So they completely rebuilt or re renovated the monastery and its surrounding buildings. And there's a new community there today, not a monastic community, but a, a community that is a place of spirituality, of learning, and of support for ecological issues. As I mentioned early, Iona is still a, a place with working crofts or farm, and there's lots of sheep everywhere. I like the brown sheep myself. There are some very famous crosses on Iona. In the Irish culture, a carved cross is an icon which is everywhere across Ireland, and they're very famous. And again, because Iona was part of that extension of the Irish culture, there were carved crosses on Iona. One of the most famous St. Martin, St. Matthew's cross right here. This is actually a replica. The original cross, parts of it are in the museum. So there is a museum on Iona. And this is a replica of it. You can see the intricate, not only drawings and illustrations that they put on crosses, but also the, the details of the types of, of, we, of uh, Celtic patterns. And this is St. Mart, St. Martin's cross. And this is original. This one you can see is quite weather. Wet, quite, quite weathered, and it had extensions that came out here and here. There are sockets for them. They were either wooden or stone, and they uh, are since long gone. There was a, a shrine in the original community of Columba where his remains were kept. Of course, they removed his remains from the island after the Vikings attacked, and that was later then that the Benedictines came in and built their monastery. But again, when the Benedictine monastery fell in disrepair and uh, MacLeod came and rebuilt it, they, this, this is a capital from one of the uh, columns inside the new monastery. It's, a, it's a, a new carving. I thought it was beautiful. There were lots of these to replace the missing capitals. The capital is what sits on the top of a column that transfers the weight of the arches that come down from the ceiling onto the column. This is the ins inside of the medieval, late medieval church from the 12th century that has been renovated, still quite beautiful. But the one thing that really struck me more than anything else in Iona was the water. 
The water is very blue and there are large sections where there's white sand and the seashore. It's a very wild and rocky shore, but there's this white sand everywhere and it gave the most beautiful blue water. I couldn't stop taking pictures of it. This spot is known as the Beach of the Martyrs. And after the last Viking raid, I wanna say like the late 800s, just before the monks gave up and went back to Ireland, there were a number of them killed by the Vikings on this beach. And that's why it's called the Beach of the Martyrs. This is the backside of the island. I'm actually standing on right off the edge of the golf course and you can see more wild, rugged, rocky coastline and white sand and beautiful blue water. Later, I went to Lindisfarne. This is on the other side. And I think I showed you uh, that it's over near the border between England and Scotland. Linda's farm was founded about a hundred years after Iona, even though the island had been settled for five to 10,000 years uh, uh, ago, uh, the Celtic community there dates to 634. There, the king of Northumbria, so he was one of the Anglo-Saxon kings, asked the Irish monks to come and settle Iona and make a place of learning and community, a mission on Iona. So monks came from Iona to Lindisfarne less than a hundred years after Iona had been settled by the first Irish monks. And again, what we're looking at here in some of these pictures of the ruins are not the ruins of the community from 634, but these are again, a late middle age, 12th and 13th century community and church that were built by Benedictines who came and settled on the island later. Lindisfarne, as I mentioned, is unique in that twice per day at high tides, it becomes an island and you can drive down a causeway to get there. You can also walk across it. And this is the pilgrim walkway. You wouldn't wanna be taking it the moment that I took this picture because the tide was either coming in or going out. Uh, I forget which, uh, but when the tide is all the way out and the mud flats are dry enough, you can walk across and these poles guide pilgrims from the mainland out here over to Iona here. I didn't get to walk it because uh, the chances I had to be there, the tide was too high. This gives you a little of an idea of Holy Island and this brown shows you all of the mud flats. So this all gets flooded during high tide and the causeway goes off the far northeastern edge of the island to the main mainland that's paved. But again, that gets covered over by the tides. So twice a day, uh, Iona becomes an island and there's a small village down at the end here. It's also where the monastic ruins are, but there are walking paths all the way across the island. I found it a delightful place to hike. And that's what I spent almost an entire day doing. Very charming village, there are inns and retreat houses there. Uh, because the it's most, most of the tours come by bus just for the day. They come across when the tide is low and they either head right back within a few hours while they can still go or they, they stay as much of the day as they can till the tide is, tide is low again and then they leave and go back. But that was one nice thing about the island was that while I was there, um, the, the last buses had to depart maybe four or five o'clock. So I had the entire island in the evening with just the locals and a few people staying there uh, to ourselves that evening. It was very quiet and very peaceful. As any other place on the, uh, in England or especially near the coast, it's full of flowers, roses, and all sorts of other uh, wild things. There's some lupines. There are several retreat houses that have nice meditative gardens that you can, you can stay in a retreat house and you can go in the gardens. And I always love the colors that people paint uh, their fences and their doors. This is the castle. And this is a uh, 16th, 15th, 16th century castle built on the high point of the island. So it's modern by uh, standards of Lindisfarne. And uh, I didn't go in the castle. I walked around it. Uh, it's now owned by a family. I think you can tour it. And Lindisfarne is also a village where there's fishing. So here's a lot of lobster pots, crab pots. And also there is farming on Linda's farm. So I found more sheep on Linda's farm. And of course, beautiful flowers everywhere along the coastline. This is the road going out to the castle. 
and lots of geese flying overhead. This is the North Shore, sandy, rocky, beautiful. And someone has made a, um, they've done this with the local stones and these are all the, the piles that I, I showed you. The ruins built out of red sandstone. This is the uh, Benedictine church and monastery. And you can again see some of these Celtic crosses erect here, erected here. You, some of these are gravestones that have Celtic crosses on them, but there were Celtic crosses everywhere, which gives you that Celtic Christian origin. It signifies the Celtic Christian origin of Lindisfarne. This is the interior of the church, which has been uh, renovated and actually went to a service there one evening. The, 20 or so pilgrims that were there alongside me. Just to give a summary, because people have asked me how long, I say that my entire pilgrimage spans six days, beginning with my flight overnight to Edinburgh. And the cost uh, was about, I would say, 120 to 150 pounds per day for lodging and food. And you have to convert that into dollars now. I think the last we checked, the cost, the uh, conversion rate of the pound to the dollar is about a dollar forty per pound. So uh, one could maybe stay there a little bit less expensively, and you can get some of your own meals. I always like to shop in grocery stores and get myself food for a lunch and sometimes a supper if I'm going to be out hiking late. I'm going to stop sharing here and bring everyone back together and ask if there are questions. Uh, yeah. time of the year did you go? Good question. See, I didn't put that in there. I should have put that. I was there in June and it was beautiful. June is one that I especially liked it because in June, the days are very long. So if you want to stay out and hike in the evening or go for walks, uh, because England is so much farther north than the US, we tend to forget how far north that is. The days are very long. So um, Two years later, in 2018, I biked across the entire UK from Cornwall to John O'Groats, which uh, uh, Land's End in Cornwall is the southwest mo southwesterly most point of England, and John O'Groats is the northernmost point in Scotland. It's about a thousand miles, and I joined a tour group, and we did a two-week trip, about averaged about 70 miles a day, and I would say the sun was up most days by about 4:30. And it went down around 1130. So it's a very, very short night. Gave you lots to do during the daylight hours. But short, short nights of sleep. When you first said Linda's Farm, I thought you were saying Linda's Farm, F-A-R-N. <laughs> <laughs> um, does Farn mean something like that? Let's see, Linda's Farn. You know what, I, that's a, just a good question. What is the uh, etymology of that word? Uh, Farn has something to do, they call those islands around there, and I didn't tell about it, but there are some smaller islands just south of Lindisfarne. I'm talking maybe a quarter mile across open water that are also called Farns, and all of those islands are called the Farns. And so uh, the question is, what is Lindisfarne? And that is that I don't know. I'm going to check out the etymology of that, though. Thank you for asking me. I, I do know that Farn is a, is a reference to the islands. Um, I, you, you'll get some notes afterwards about this and you'll see how it's spelled there if you, if you wanna see a reference to it again. In my notes for Lindus Farn, I also give you a link where you can find the tide chart because I tell anyone who ever visits Lindus, Lindus Farn, you have to know the tide chart in advance. In late June through early September, I believe, there is a daily bus which leaves Berwick and goes to Lindisfarne and back. So that's like a local bus, probably about five pounds or something to ride it, not very expensive. But it's limited each day by the tide. So you have to check and, and see, well, it's going to be a high tide when the bus says it's going to be running. I guess I'm not going to get there at that time that day. And same thing if you're, uh, I actually took a taxi from Burke. I took the train from Edinburgh to Burke 
was about an hour and a half ride. And then I took a taxi, it cost me about 20 pounds to take a taxi out there, be cheaper if you had a couple other people going. Uh, do people bike uh, when the tide is low, bike across and then bike on the island too, or no? I bet they do. I didn't see any that I remember that day, but you certainly could do it. And people, of course, walk, walk it. There is a five, four or five day pilgrimage, which ends up on Linda's farm that starts in the borders near the town of Melrose. <clears throat> and I have not walked that pilgrimage, but I've walked part of the route of that pilgrimage uh, in 2017. I stayed in the borders after learning about them and uh, did hiking and walked on that. So you can walk, I think it's about a hundred kilometers and they go slowly. I think they only go about 20 kilometers a day, which is at most, which is 12 miles. More questions. Did you combine this trip with somewhere else? I did. Yeah. I did. And some of you who have seen my class where I talk about taking a tour of the city of York, that's actually part of the same long trip. I went to the UK for three weeks in 2016. Um, my wife and I wanted a longer trip together in the UK. So we were together for two of those three weeks. Uh, my wife couldn't get a third week uh, off, so she needed to be home for one week. So I went by myself to Iona and Lindisfarne first. And then after I was, and, and I actually visited the islands in the reverse order of what you saw today. I actually went to Lindisfarne first, then went all the way across Scotland to Iona second, and then came back to Edinburgh where I met my wife. She flew into Edinburgh. I picked her up. We rented a car from, uh, we rented a car from the, the airport in Edinburgh. And that was one of the last times I rented a car on a trip um, because I've since discovered to just decide it's better just to go by foot and use local transport than hassle with a car. But we rented a car and we were staying north of Edinburgh for a week in a town called Aberdour. We went into Edinburgh, but we also went all the way up to um, St. Andrews. And then we went to, uh, uh, so other places in Scotland, Dunfermline and Stirling. And then we drove down to York and we dropped off our car in York and then spent a week in York without a car. And there's really good transport from York, uh, local transport and train. We went to Durham for a day. We went to Whitby for a day. And we just enjoyed York itself over several days. We decided that we, we really enjoyed staying in one place and seeing everything that it had. And it was during the drive from Edinburgh, which is in Scotland, down to York, which is in the northern part of England, that we went through what's called the borders. And I discovered how lovely the borders were and what particular history they had. You also cross over Hadrian's Wall, though the spot where we crossed it, we couldn't see it, it was gone. Could you communicate well with the locals? No problem at all. I will say, though, that a drunk Scotsman is very hard to understand. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people have a hard time understanding the Scott, Scott uh, dialect or, uh, or accent. My ears tune to it, but when they're drunk, it's really hard to understand. It's also hard to understand somebody in Virginia when they're drunk, too. Any more questions? I'll send you some notes after the class with some links and you can uh, research it more on your own if you'd like. These are delightful places to visit and I really encourage people to find, to seek out spots like this uh, to take a journey to. Um, it's, they're kind of off the beaten path. And even though they each have tourists that go there, there are also people that go there for deeper reasons and that what's, that's what makes them so special. Uh, this afternoon, I do have a class at four o'clock, switching to the other hemisphere, foods of Guanajuato, which is in Mexico. So we'll be looking at some video about learning about the special foods, learn all about tacos, which are not what you get at Taco Bell. Mm -hmm. And more classes next week. I want to just invite you to spend time 
checking out my, my schedule for classes. I'll take one minute here and show you how to find that. Um, if you go to the Get Set Up page and it looks something like this, let me search for it. homepage, which you all would be familiar with if you go in to log in for your classes, you just search the guide's name right here. So you put R-U-S-S -S and you see all my classes. So if you're ever interested in knowing what cl more classes I have on travel or anything else, feel free to search for my name here, sign up for a class. You can also share those classes with other people so they can also take them. Last call, did any you, questions? Did you arrange all your um, housing ahead of time? I did. Um, and I know, Pam, you're interested in learning how to, how to do all that planning. We stayed at yeah. an Airbnb in York and in Edinburgh. I stayed in a small hotel in Lindisfarne and I stayed in a bed and breakfast on uh, the town across the sound from Iona. And I also spent one other night at an Airbnb in Glasgow while I was waiting for my wife. So I've used both. Uh, I, can, I can commend all of them. Um, I forget exactly how I booked the, the bed and breakfast uh, on Fiona Fort. Um, probably did some of this through booking.com or just went and searched bed and breakfast Iona. I didn't stay on the island of Iona because uh, the time I was there in June, a lot of people like to stay in the island and their lodging was very limited. And the place I stayed was a five minute ferry ride across the sound. So it was no problem for me. There were, there were more places to eat in the evening in the other village than there are in Iona. Well, thank you everyone. Um, I welcome you to come back to other travel classes, uh, either if you're present here live or if you're on streaming TV, look for it this afternoon, four o'clock, Foods of Guanajuato, and then all sorts of classes next week on travel. Hope to see some of you there. Otherwise, have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. You too, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.